Hi, I'm Patrick Mooney. Um, I'm a software engineer at Join, and tonight I'd like to talk about exec. So, oh goodness. Why exec? Um, you know, we've had a lot of great talks tonight on, on a bunch of fantastic subjects. Why should we talk about the exec system call, right? It's, it's just, it's commonplace. We, we use it every day, but, but who cares? It's, it's, it, 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 it's just exec. Um, but I would argue that it's an essential function of the system. When we think about general purpose computers, their job is to do just that, to compute, to do our work. This isn't like the, the tar a mechanical targeting computer on an old battleship. We want our phone to run the programs that we we want to run, or our servers, or our laptops, or whatever. Um, so in, in that way, it, it is essential to the system. And in addition to that, it is a gateway to other system topics. Exec kind of touches a lot of things in the system, um, and, and can kind of expose us to those things, um, and, and let us enjoy those things. So for those reasons, I like exec a lot. Moving forward, um, I, I wanted to invoke a Cantrillian uh, tradition here. We're going to go to the Unix v6 man page for old exec. Um, and we see here, exec overlays the calling process with the named file, then transfers to the beginning of the core image of the file. There can be no return from the file. The calling core image is lost. Now, if we set aside our apprehension about that statement of loss at the end here, we have kind of a general roadmap for what we want to do. We've got a named file. We've got some arguments that we provided, but, but th this is kind of our deal, that this is what we want to do. So when we talk about the named file, what are we talking about? Obviously, it's a file. It's got to exist. It's got to have the appropriate permissions. You know, we, we, the user has to be able to execute it, that sort of thing. Um, but when we look further into it, you know, maybe this thing is a shell script. You know, you've, you've got a shebang. Maybe it's a bash script. Maybe it's, maybe it's a, a Python program. Maybe it's a bash script that would interpret a Python program, right? It's, it, it could be anything. But once you walk through this chain of interpreters, you know, bash script, Python, whatever, eventually we, we expect to find ourselves presented with a binary, right? Something that we can actually run on this microprocessor. Now, if we're going to be, you know, if it's Windows or, or the new EFI stuff, it's going to be formatted as PCOF. Um, on OS X or iOS, it's going to be a mock O binary. But for the vast majority of other things, Linux, most of the Unixes, um, we're going to be talking about an ELF file, an extensible linker format file. So, let, let's say we have an ELF file. Let, let's just use bin true. Let's, let's grab something that is easy, that's simple, um, and, and let's step through that. So, what do we have at the beginning of the at the beginning of this file? Well, we've got a header that says ELF that tells the system that this is in fact an ELF file. That you know, when it's walking through, looking at the headers of those files, trying to see if it can actually execute this on the microprocessor, that it can in fact execute this. It's got details about is it 32 bit? You know, what what operating system is it designed for? Linux omits that field all the time. Um, but other operating systems write themselves in there. Um, and that it's actually an executable. You, you can have ELF libraries, right? This, this could be a library that you can't actually execute. It could even be a core file. That's how core files are omitted from the system. They, they have a format very similar to the binary that they represent. So th this is all fine and good, but you know, when we read through that man page, we've got to overlay the core here. So how do we do this? We're, we're not just you know, copying a, the V program from a tape drive or a, or a floppy disk into the memory of some, some tiny little computer. We, we've actually got to load this thing and do it intelligently. The, this file has more there. So we can see here we've got a couple of program headers, PT load segments, um, that describe some portion of the file that we want to load. The, the offset in the file, and it has some details about how we want to load that. So if you look at the P flags, we've got actually the protection bits that we want on this piece of memory, either executable and readable, what we would expect in a text segment, or um, in this case, also uh, readable and writable. That's a little bit odd. I didn't think bin true was doing that much, but that's, that's fine. We'll, we can deal with that. So what about those addresses we saw that it wanted to load into? They look rather specific. Um, and while this is a 32-bit process, you know, what, what if this was a 64-bit process and they said, hey, you know, put that at the address of a terabyte, and I don't have a terabyte of physical memory in this machine. What, what is going on here? Well, it turns out those addresses aren't physical addresses. Those are virtual addresses. Um, and this is something that the microprocessor and the operating system both handle together so that we can give a process, give a, a program 
program, and uh, uh, a memory space that to it looks like it owns the entire, the, the entire machine. It's got this huge address space, and only it is in it. And the microprocessor and the operating system behind the scenes create this, well, the, the operating system creates this, this uh, system of tables that translate a virtual address, which the program thinks is real memory, into um, addresses that are backed by actual memory, physical chips, right? They, they, they are actually in physical memory. And there are some neat things about this um, that because they are backed by these pages, um, but the operating system controls that, the operating system can actually just kind of set up a, a, an entry for that mapping, and it doesn't actually have to load the whole program. So if this were not been true with some tiny mem size, but with some gigabyte application, you wouldn't want to necessarily haul, have to haul the whole thing into memory. Well, it doesn't need to. It can just say, well, these virtual addresses map to this file, and if you hit one of them, let me know, and I'll, I'll load it in. So we can save some time there, especially if that gigabyte program is something where you've tried to execute it, and you know I got the flags wrong, and it's like, well, uh, you, you got the flag wrong, and I copied a gigabyte into memory for you. That, that sucks. <laughs> Um, so we have a virtual address space here, and, and we've got kind of a, a good idea about what's going on. But there's actually more here than what we can see, because in addition to this program's address space, the kernel is actually here. And, and these, these translation tables, the, the, the mapping from virtual addresses to physical addresses, is it's one big mapping. So the kernel actually has to be in there as well. When you make a system call, you're jumping into the kernel, you're not switching out the address space. You're all still in the same area of memory. So the kernel is typically way up in the much higher addresses. Um, and something that's important here is you recall that statement of loss. We're going to be losing that old image. Well, where do you think those the, the arguments to our program are stored? There, there's strings in memory of that old image. Well, if we just threw that out and we can only have one mapping at once here, we would lose our arguments. And I don't know how I executed this program. But because the kernel is sitting here up in the, the higher bits of the address space, the kernel can say, hey, I'm going to exec this thing. Let's, let's gather those arguments, the, the environment strings, all of that stuff, let's gather it up before we throw this address space out. Because when we do, it's gone, and I'm, I'm going to be in the woods. We're, we're kind of in a sticky place. So we're ready to go, right? We've found the binary. We've, we've created our memory mappings. We made sure to copy the arguments before we threw the old address space away, environment things, everything like that. We're ready to go, right? Well, so there's kind of one more thing. We, we go, we, we have to look up the entry point for the system. We, we need to know where to jump into memory to start executing this thing. And as we're looking through the program headers, we see something else, and we see this PT interp header. We're thinking, okay, a, an interpreter. I thought we had a binary here. I, I thought we were gonna go run some machine instructions. Uh, what's the deal? Um, and it, the, the thing here is that most binaries that we run are going to use some libraries, right? We, we don't just, I, there are some notable exceptions like frickin' Golang on Linux, but by and large, you, you don't have everything you need in this binary. You're gonna need some libraries, and we don't place the expectation upon that program to have to know how to load those libraries, right? Otherwise, every program that used, li used libraries would have all this junk about going where to find them, and, and a lot of that has to do with the system. So we rely on this interpreter, LD.so, to set up that environment for us. And, and the interpreter actually runs first. We map that into the address space, and it gets to go first before our program has anything. So when, when we think about been true, we're thinking, oh yeah, it's just exit zero, right? We, we need a, a successful return code that you would just compile that down to the, the system call, right? And in the case of your weird Golang stuff, maybe. But in all other sane programs, you're going to make a library call, right? You're going to make your C library call to call exit. And if we disassemble the, the program here, we can see that. We, we push our, our, our successful return code onto the stack and we're, we're calling exit. Um, but when this, this program was compiled, we knew that we would not have the C library um, until, it was, until it was given to us. So what this, this call is, this uh, procedure linkage table, is how this program says, you know what, these are all the functions that I'm going to need to, to execute the things that I want. And they're represented by libraries, and those are annotated in those ELF headers. But in terms of how I actually call them, we can go disassemble that, that, uh, that plit, and we can see that we jump 
to using an address as our source for, th this hard-coded address is where we're looking for the place that we're gonna jump. So when we call this initially, the, the linker has not bothered to fill this in, so that address will actually point to the next instruction that says, hey, push this value that the linker's gonna know something to do with, and actually jump to the linker and say, hey, linker, I wanna call exit. I don't know where it is. You mapped in the C library somewhere into the address space. Fill this thing out, and the linker will go write it into that, that memory space. That's why there was a writable segment in a program that really doesn't have variables. It, it needed this, this PLT um, to be writable so that the next, I mean, you're not gonna make another call to exit, but if this was something like read, where you're calling it all the time, the next time you come in, you go reference that memory location, surprise, it's actually got the address to the read function, and you can just jump straight through it. The other neat thing is this is another case where you can be lazy. If, you're, if your program calls 10,000 different functions, right, you, it, it's another case of, oh, you know, I, I've got a program and I, I typed the, the arguments to the program wrong. If the linker went and filled in all the PLTs for 10,000 or a million different functions, there'd be a lot of work to do up front. So instead, it can go and you can ask for them the moment you need them, and it will go fill them in for them. So we have all of these pieces, and what do we get? We get bin true, and we echo, and we've got our zero return code. Everything has worked together to bring us this, this zero. <laughs> So I hope this was a, a nice look into some of the moving pieces that happen when you, when you call exec. Um, further reading, um, this was uh, based on an Illumos system. Um, I'm biased here, because I, I work on Illumos, but I, I think it is clearer code to read than, than the Linux kernel. I have to read both. Um, so if, if you're interested in, in more things on this topic, the Illumos source code is great. You can go to user source UTS, that's where the kernel is. Um, that's where all the fun stuff is. Um, and then in terms of libraries, there's linkers and libraries library's guide by Sun, who was bought by somebody else, I won't name. Um, so thank you. That's all. Thank you.